Astonishing Legends would like to thank Sunsoil, BetterHelp, Western Digital, Quip, Simply Safe, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. Last week, we introduced you to legendary UFO cryptid and anomaly researcher and data collector Stan Gordon and his friend, Kecksburg volunteer fireman Ron Struble, to talk about one of the most famous UFO crashes in history. It's easy when you listen to our show to see the stories we cover as isolated incidents, and maybe many of them are. But the older our show gets, the more topics we cover, the more it seems like there may be connections between anomalous events that are as intriguing as the events themselves. As you might imagine, Stan Gordon has been talking about the Kecksburg incident since it happened. He was 16 years old at the time, but he'd been interested in UFO research since he was 10. He was happy to come on our show and share his insights about Kecksburg, but he was also quick to add that Kecksburg was only a small piece of a much bigger and more complicated puzzle than you might imagine. Stan is back to open that door for you, dear listeners, and as far out as it seems, he will plainly state that most reports of unusual sightings, be it UFO, cryptid, or Bigfoot, for example, are misidentifications of natural or man-made objects. But... They'll also tell you that there are many more sightings that defy explanation. In fact, Stan found a direct correlation between an uptick in UFO sightings and Bigfoot encounters. Most notably, during the 1973 UFO flap, for which Stan's organization was out in the field with a two-way radio dispatch team of investigators. That team included scientists, engineers, and police officers, among others, and they covered the entire state of Pennsylvania, a hotspot at the time. So much was happening, and his operation was so respected that much like the movie Ghostbusters, the police began directing calls about UFOs and cryptids directly to Stan's Westmoreland County UFO Study Group. When you hear his perspective on the cases they investigated, you will recall an oft-used phrase from Astonishing Legends. Everything is connected. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is legendary UFO researcher Stan Gordon. Their attention is drawn to a barbed wire fence about 75 feet away. Along that barbed wire fence are these two huge, upright, hair-covered, man-like creatures. Arms are so long, they're hanging down almost to the ground. They're covered with long, dark, matted hair hanging off the body. They have no neck. They have luminous, green, glowing eyes. And they're making this loud, baby-crying, whining noise. Join us tonight as we return to the Chestnut Ridge area of Pennsylvania with Stan Gordon. And we're back. And this is All Colors Sam. You can't just keep doing that for every show. Is that your, is that... It sounded so cool the last one. I was just Oh, yeah, but this time I didn't. I, I told Ryan not to do anything with it because I want Damn. you to stop doing it. All right, so it's just going to sound like a really crummy British accent. <laughs> the curtain All right. is pulled All right, I, I get it. All right, fine. All right, folks. We, we got a great show tonight. Just a few quick words before we get back into it. Uh, we'd like to thank Ron Struble again for joining us last week and let everyone know that our graphic designer, Tommy Beaver, has started the design process on a Kecksburg 2020 t-shirt commemorating the festival, even though they can't have have it this year, and that shirt is going to be cool. We'll let you know as soon as that design is finalized and the shirt is available in our store. Again, all net proceeds from the sale of that shirt are going to be donated to the Kecksburg Volunteer Fire Department to help them get through this year when they don't have the festival to lean on for donations and income. Yes, and we'd also like to point out that we have links to all of Stan's books in the show notes for both last week's episode and this one as well. Now, Stan himself advised us that it might be better to try Amazon or Barnes & Noble first because things are moving a little slower on his end with direct fulfillment due to COVID. But we've provided links to all the places you can find his work on the webpage for the episode. I want to explain a little something here, too. There is a main body of links for those of you who have visited the web pages for each episode in a section called reference links. And those are all the research links that we use or anything that's interesting or, or lead into somebody's work or a guest on the show's uh, endeavors. 
So they're in there as well. But normally, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a section called related books. And that's any books that are related to the topic of the episode, either written by a, a guest or just books that we read to research. But anyway, I wanted to point that out. And that points to Amazon specifically in that uh, related books, because that's a function of the Squarespace website. But yes, you can find Stan's books and his DVD on Amazon.com. And also his books are on Barnes and Noble. So uh, go to those two places and we'll have links to those as well. Okay, and one other cryptic note for everyone. We've got a lot of surprises planned for October this year. And I mean top to bottom stuff going on. So keep your ears tuned to our feed because some really, really cool stuff is happening. Do indeed. Well, all righty, let's dive back in here. Now, where were we? Well, we talked about Kecksburg. We did that last week, but Stan has got a lot more to say. And there's part of this story that I wanted to share that I thought was kind of funny because we alluded to this a little bit last week, but we've been trying to line Stan up for a long time time because we thought, well, this is the other guy who we could get that really knows about Kecksburg. We can do a new interview with him. We'll reset this show. We'll put it out there. But he was hard to reach and he was constantly uh, doing shows. He's on the road. He's a very busy man. Plus it was for us. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It was for, and he didn't know who we were. I, I called <laughs> him and and I remember yeah. him saying, no, I'd be happy to come on your show. Check back with me in eight months. So we would, <laughs> so we would wait. No, he, he, was, he was very busy. <laughs> yeah. I also want to give a shout out of thanks to Seth Breedlove because yes. he put in a good word for us. Yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't have had Stan. It's like, Stan, these guys aren't insane. Yeah, they're not a bunch of yes. a of yahoos. Not yes. that much. But so that really helped. But yes, yeah, so it was a it was a timing issue. And really, he's the second guy in this big debate. The other thing, and yes, thank you again, Seth, for that. But the, the other thing about it, too, that I remember when we first reached him was he said, hey, look, you know, I can come talk about Kecksburg. I've been talking about it my whole life. But he goes, but there's so much more. There's so much more. There's so much more going on here. <laughs> yeah. You guys need to hear about that. And that's what tonight's episode is about. It's about the stuff that he's like, yeah, I've talked about Kecksburg till I'm blue in the face, but man, wait till you hear all the other stuff that is going on around here. Well, that's the bigger picture. And that's why you need guys like Stan who have diligently been studying this for, what do you say this year? 61 years now. Yeah. Yeah. So he's he's devoted his life to this. And uh, there's no better reputation in the field, I think, for gathering the data, collecting and analyzing it, interviewing people and and being very forthright about all of it for that long. So he's very well respected and, and uh, he's the go to guy. So, of course, you want to hear what are the observations here? What are the connections? What are the correlations? What patterns do you see? Because that's all you get. And I, you know, I'll bring this point up later here, but it's such a hard thing to study because, uh, and again, I might explain this a little further, but I think when you try to analyze and research this particular topic, these incidents of high strangeness and, and weirdness and try to make some sense out of it, you're chasing a moving target. It's never going to settle down and let you analyze it fully. So, you know, my hat's off to him for spending this long and not just throwing up his hands at some point saying like, okay, that, none of this makes sense. We're done. He's still at it. So yeah, and, and this is all the stuff that we love to talk about because what is the bigger picture here? Okay, so we recorded this all at once, but we split it in half. So we're going to go back to our discussion and interview with Stan here, which we picked back up after uh, Ron signed off last week. We'll be back after this to share our closing thoughts and conclusions. All right, Sarah, roll the rest of our talk with Stan Gordon. So Stan, one of the things that I think is really interesting about you is how long you've been at this, watching your documentary, which was obviously made many years ago, and just knowing that you've been involved in this kind of research for so long and in that area for so long, has this been your primary source of income for all these years or do you, are you having to work a day job too on top of all this? I always had a full-time day job. I worked in electronics field all my life. I'm retired from it now, but I also did this full-time too. Right. And uh, so I've been this year will mark uh, 61 years of research. I started in 1959 when I was 10 years old. I've been out in the field investigating cases since the Kexper case in 1965. I've interviewed thousands of UFO witnesses and actually hundreds of people who claim they've seen Bigfoot and other strange creatures in Pennsylvania. And I think many of your listeners will find interesting that I have never personally seen a UFO or a Bigfoot myself. <laughs> yeah, you've mentioned that before. Well, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess the other thing is, uh, when you started out, you were organizing the research group that you organized for Pennsylvania. 
And maybe because of your electronics experience, you were able to set up a sophisticated two-way radio operation and dispatch researchers or, or uh, people to investigate almost as soon as things happened. Is that true? Yeah, actually, uh, in the late 1960s, there was a small research group in Pittsburgh called the UFO Research Institute. That's where Stanton Friedman began his uh, involvement in the UFO field. He was working for Westinghouse at the time, and Stan was a little older than I was. I was a youngster of their group, but I already had a lot of experience interviewing eyewitnesses and uh, know quite a bit about the subject, so I became a telephone sighting coordinator. So when a call would come in, I would get the initial report, interview the witness, and determine if the case would warrant further investigation. So I stayed with that group until they decided to shut down their operation, and in 1969, I decided I was going to set up a hotline for the public to report UFO sightings. So I began to make contact with the local news media, and the police told them what I was doing. And back in those days, there was a lot more ridicule than there is today. But I had tried to be very serious about it, and I don't remember getting a line of ridicule or anything. But as word got out there about my hotline, the telephone in my home was just ringing day and night with calls coming in. And it wasn't just on UFOs. Anything unusual from... Strange sounds, alleged haunted houses, strange creatures, anything unusual people are calling me about. Well, I became overwhelmed very quickly. This was a lot more than I could handle on my own. So I was determined to try to set up a group of research people to investigate these reports. So in 1970, I founded the first of three research groups where, that for many years would investigate sightings uh, in Pennsylvania. The first group was a Westmoreland County UFO study group. So it started here. Uh, in Greensburg, where I live, and we extended into the Pittsburgh area. And the group was kind of unique in that majority of people involved were specialists, scientists, engineers, technicians, police officers, uh, former military personnel, medical people. We had all kinds of specialists who were volunteering their time to work on these cases, and we did it 24 hours a day around our jobs. And by 1973... We had extended to cover the whole state of Pennsylvania. And we were actually surprised where some of our reports were coming in from. Because you've got to remember back in those days, there's no cell phones, there's no internet. A lot of people would initially call the, the police or sometimes the news to report something. And we were beginning to get referrals from a lot of these sources. So we were very, very busy. I mean, we could have done this as a full-time job, but we weren't getting paid for it. And we were very lucky that we were set up. Because 1973, first we had the, a massive UFO wave, started January 1st and continued to the end of the year. Hundreds and hundreds of UFO cases coming in from across the state. And interestingly, there was a lot of news media coverage, so the newspapers, the radio and TV would cover some of these cases. So we're very busy just checking out all these reports. And yes, with my electronics background, I set up a large radio communication center and a two-way radio dispatch system in my house so we could be in contact with a lot of the researchers in our areas to uh, be in contact with these cases we're ongoing. So all this UFO activity is going on. And, and again, as I found when I began to go out in the field in 1965 and still the same today, when you take the time to properly investigate these incidents, whether it be a UFO or something different, even alleged Bigfoot sightings, many of the sightings are determined to be misidentification of natural or man-made objects. Lots of misidentification with UFO reports, uh, even today. Bright stars, planets, drones, Chinese lanterns, space stations, meteorological phenomena, a lot of different things you can explain. But every year we continue to get reports you cannot explain away so easily. And I can tell you there's hundreds of cases I've worked on that actually are much stranger than Kecksburg and much more unusual. But going back to 1973, there were a lot of cases you could explain, but there were many low-level, very close-range, detailed UFO cases being reported. These things were hovering over highways. They were hovering over cars. There were incidents on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. There were landing reports. It was an amazing time. So we're just very, very busy responding to all these UFO cases. I, I went into great detail about this in my book called Silent Invasion, the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot Casebook. So in the summer of 73, we had the biggest Bigfoot outbreak ever documented. This went on for months and months into early 1974. And I can tell you, every year since then, there have been Bigfoot sightings reported in Pennsylvania. 
including many in the last couple of years, and many of them were close range, even some in daylight at very close range. Very interesting cases, and that's a whole another story. But anyhow, 1973, you have all these reports coming in. And it was during that time that I began to realize that there were some very unusual aspects of some of these, especially the Bigfoot reports, that we were not expecting to find. I mean, again, I kept an open mind, but at the same time, I was very skeptical of a lot of information out there. I felt that if Bigfoot was real, they're probably some type of unknown animal, some type of unknown primate. Well, as these reports are coming in, and my teams are getting out to some of these locations, so you got to understand, in many instances, my teams, myself or my teams, or in some cases, even the police agencies, were on the scene within minutes to hours after they occurred. So we're documenting all this as it's taking place. And we'd get out to some of these locations, and we see these large, unusual footprints with large strides between them that went for a distance and suddenly stopped, vanished, and disappeared, sometimes even in fresh snow. And that's still going on even in recent years, by the way. It didn't make any sense. There was no way under the conditions we found that that could have been fabricated. And then other strange things began to come to our attention. We began to see one pattern was we'd have a UFO sighting in a certain area. Within minutes to hours to days later, we'd have a Bigfoot sighting or vice versa. And then it got much more intriguing when we began to have these well-documented cases of Bigfoot and UFOs seen together at the same time and place. And if you want, I can go into some detail about that. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to hear whatever you have to say. Some of these cases with the Bigfoot sightings were, first of all, very intriguing because, one, in some cases they were in daylight back in 73 again. Sometimes there's more than one creature was seen together. At some of the locations we get out there, there'd be physical evidence that we would gather up or make cast of footprints. Again, we're thinking these are all, if these are real, there's some type of unknown primate. Well, all these strange reports are coming in. One of the reports was um, north of Pittsburgh, September 27th. There are two witnesses out in the country waiting for a friend to pick them up. They see this around seven foot tall, hairy, upright creature with long arms covered with white hair running across the road towards the woods, but in one of its hands, there's a glowing ball of light. And it wasn't long after this object came across the sky and a beam of light was emitted from the object down into the woods where the creature ran into. Well, that we found pretty fascinating. But among the many cases we had was an incident that happened up in Fayette County, Pennsylvania. You mentioned before about the Chestnut Ridge. Well, the Chestnut Ridge historically and continues to be probably one of the most active, unusual areas in the country. The Chestnut Ridge is a mountain range that extends, it's around 100 miles long, through Westmoreland, Fayette, and Indiana County in southwest PA, and it extends down into West Virginia outside of Morgantown in Preston County. Year after year, UFO sightings, Bigfoot encounters, cryptid reports, mystery booms, light phenomena, all kind of strange things to public reporting, including in recent weeks. And this goes on year after year. These days, it seems like companies are putting CBD in everything. And if, if you don't know where to start, there's a company in Vermont that's down to earth and doing things differently. Sunsoil. Literally down to earth. Yeah, so many of us have become very conscious of what we're putting in our bodies. I've certainly learned to scrutinize those ingredient labels for additives. And many times what I find, I have to ask myself, does this ingredient even exist in the natural world? Or why is the thing I want to buy not the first ingredient? Yeah, no kidding. Uh, if you're buying marinara sauce, tomatoes should not be the fifth ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, Sun Soil is different, though. It's an honest, genuine CBD product. And frankly, that's why we're proud to promote them on the show. All you got to do is take a look at the ingredients, and you'll immediately appreciate just how uncomplicated a Sun Soil product really is. Sun Soil keeps it simple, as it should be. In fact, most of their CBD products have just two simple ingredients, coconut oil and hemp. And if you shopped around for quality CBD oils at all, like I have, I can tell you that Sunsoil is very affordable. They farm their own hemp, stick to simple ingredients, as we've said, and offer higher quality CBD at half the price of other brands. Well, as I've mentioned before, for me anyway, it does seem to provide some relief. I'll take it before exercise or after if I'm feeling a little sore or creaky, but you got to try it out for yourself. 
I use the Sun Soil 20 milligram CBD liquid soft gels, and it seems like it's the right dosage for me. But like we've been talking about, at least you know what you're taking. And I know a lot of us are feeling a tad stressed from time to time these days, myself included. So when my mind's racing right before bed, and, and this is just me, a little sun soil feels like it helps me relax enough to nod off. And I don't wake up with that groggy sleep aid feeling. This is a USDA certified organic product grown on a beautiful farm in Vermont without using any pesticides, herbicides, or GMOs. Sunsoil makes pure and simple CBD products at an unbeatable price. Get 30% off your first order by going to sunsoil.com slash legends. That's S-U-N-S-O-I-L dot com slash legends for 30% off your first order. Hi, I'm Josh, and you're listening to Astonishing Legends with Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Now, back to the show. So anyhow, all this activity was going on, but this particular case was outside of Uniontown in a small rural area, probably one of the strangest cases ever documented. It's October 25th, 1973. My hotline had been ringing for 24 hours with numerous UFO reports coming in from across the state. I got a phone call from a state trooper from the Uniontown barracks about 10.30 that night. He had just came back from investigating this incident. He asked me if I could get a team assembled, if I could get the team up there as soon as possible. He thought there was a chance there was something still up in the field. So it was late that night, but we did. We got our, our radiation gear, our radios, other equipment. We got our equipment together, found our way up to uh, Fayette County during the early morning hours. Found out about 9 o'clock that night, there was about 15 witnesses in this rural community, and just people standing outside looking at this barn-sized big huge red ball of light about 100 feet off the ground slowly moving downwards towards the ground the farmer's son who was a big fella got to know him very well he was going down to his dad's farm where this was taking place just to visit and he sees people standing outside and he sees this object in the sky so he decided to go up on the hill to a neighbor to get a better view of what this thing might be so as he's watching with two of the young neighbor boys it looks like it's going to land on his dad's pasture they decide they're going to go up and see what this thing is. He stops over at his dad's farm, grabs a thirty out 6 which is a pretty high-powered weapon, a handful of ammunition. In that ammunition, he didn't realize until he got out in the field, he had two tracers. So those tracers, when you fire them, you just get that luminous trail. Anyhow, as they're driving down the farm road, close to the pasture, the dogs around the area are very, very excited and they're barking a lot. They hear this high-pitched whining noise and these loud baby crying sounds. And they park the truck at an angle to leave their headlights on so they can get a, a luminous path to get up the hill. But they see something unusual in that it looks like something's draining the power from the headlights. They'd never seen that before. Like It was real weak. And they finally make their way up to the top of the hill of the pasture, and they're standing there. And they can't believe what they're seeing because about 250 feet away, this object is now on the ground or right above it. And now it's a big, it's not a complete sphere, it's like a half a sphere, like a big white dome, about 100 feet in diameter, illuminating the whole area, making that line, loud uh, whirling sound. So standing there, can't believe what they're seeing, but a short time later, their attention is drawn to a barbed wire fence about 75 feet away. Along that barbed wire fence are these two huge, upright, hair-covered, man-like creatures, ape-like, man-like, couldn't tell exactly. Arms are so long, they're hanging down almost to the ground. They're covered with long, dark, matted hair hanging off the body. They have no neck. They have luminous, green, glowing eyes, and they're making this loud, baby-crying whining noise. The one in front is about eight feet tall. The one behind is about seven feet tall. They're walking very slow, one behind the other. The one kid so scared he runs out of the field. The other young fellow starts yelling at the older fellow, shoot him, shoot him. So he takes his first shot, which is a tracer. He just had that luminous trail. He fires his second shot, which is a second tracer. But when he does, the largest of the two creatures makes a loud whining, crying sound, reaches out with its one hand as so to grab at that tracer. At that moment, that large object in the field suddenly vanishes and disappears. 
It doesn't take off. It just physically is gone. Most of the luminosity is gone. The loud whining noise is gone. The two large hair-covered creatures turn around and start walking back along that fence line back towards the woods where they came from in that direction. At that point, he's firing from his 30 odd sixers live ammo into the two creatures, mainly aiming at the larger one. And that fellow said to me for years and years, he said, I'll never forget how that thing kept staring at me with his glowing green eyes as I'm firing into it with no effect on it whatsoever. So they ran back to the truck and went to the farmhouse, told the family what happened. They took them to a neighbor and they called the state police. When the troop arrived about 45 minutes later, the witness said, look, just forget about it. You're not going to believe me. And the troop said, look, we had a report of two similar creatures on a mountain the night before. I have to investigate the report. So they went up in the patrol car, up into the field where all the activity had taken place, looking for evidence. The trooper told me the area where the object had been on the ground was self-illuminescent and glowing, about 100 feet or more in diameter. He said the farm animals wouldn't go anywhere near it. He said that glow extended up, I believe it was about 12 inches off the ground. And he said, I aimed my flashlight beam into it. I could barely see the beam. And he said, if I had a newspaper, he said, I'm sure I could have read the newspaper from the glow coming off of that area. Well, there was other things that, like I said, we could talk for hours about this case. At some point, they left the field and they went back to the barracks. And I was told both the trooper and the witness were separately taken to two separate rooms and separately interviewed. Then they called me to send my team up. And during the night, some very strange things happened. Again, I detail this whole thing in my silent invasion book. It's too detailed and too unusual to get into. It's so much detail. That was the case that convinced me and some of my very skeptical research people that we're dealing with something in the UFO Bigfoot field that is much stranger than we had ever expected. And other cases began to occur and come to our attention, some that were even stranger. And now that I've investigated hundreds of Bigfoot sightings over the years, and I've been in touch with many researchers throughout the country and around the world and many, many witnesses. And even in the last 2018 and 2019, we had a surge of activity again, nothing like 73, but some very detailed unusual reports coming in from the public that suggested more and more that the Bigfoot phenomena is much more unusual than just an unknown type animal. And there was one case in 1974 that was the case of all cases that convinced me that as reluctant as I am to say it, that we might be dealing with a phenomena that has a physical and a non-physical component to it, which is why there's no bodies, and for a lack of a better term, we might be dealing with something that's interdimensional. Mm. And if you want, I can go into some of those details as well. Uh, yeah, please. I'd, I'd love. I mean, this is fascinating stuff. Uh, we did a super in-depth series on the Patterson-Gimlin film. And we interviewed Bob Gimlin in person, uh, I guess, a little over a year ago now. So I, I am super fascinated with this and this possible connection because I, I think it's really interesting because it plays into the whole idea about why these creatures might be so hard to find and track if they're popping in and out of our reality, frankly. Exactly. And we could talk for hours and hours about what I've been uncovering on this. I have a lecture I do just on this last few years called Strange Aspects of Elusive Bigfoot. I've been getting for all kinds of groups, and I'm telling you, the, the positive response I'm getting from people is, that's the only thing that makes any sense anymore, which is why there's no bodies. And it was right. a case in February 6, 1974, which um, I believe Seth had on the documentary. Uh, he went into the last couple of cases we talked about, and this was a case where this was get up in Fayette County, right around the Chestnut Ridge area. This is up in the Ohio Pile area. And I remember that very, very well. And some of your listeners will remember the time period. Was, there was a big national trucker strike. There was uh, some violence going on around the country with, like, shootings and all. There was gas rationing, so some people remember that. Mm -hmm. I was oh, yeah. young, but I remember it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with inflation now. There you go. And because of what was going on in Pennsylvania, the state police and the National Guard were patrolling together. I couldn't get gas to get up to the site till early the next morning. But you had some personnel from both the National Guard and the state police responded to this incident. And so when I, I was up there early the next morning with another investigator, by the time I got up there, everything was back to normal. 
But I talked to the main, the main state police investigator, and he said, I don't know what happened up there, but he said something very strange occurred. He said by the time they found the place, everything had stopped. But based on the animal reactions, something very strange occurred. And that is something that I have seen personally. And I said a long ago, you can fool people, but you can't fool the animals. <laughs> right. In numerous cases, when the, even the most vicious dogs are close to the Bigfoot, they're just like paralyzed. They don't bark. They shake. They cower. They hide. People tell me sometimes they'll see them laying down. They'll roll their eyes around, but they won't move or make a sound. I remember the, the trooper told me that these people had several big dogs, and when they got there, it was dead silent. The dogs wouldn't move. One of them, I think, was at a pen or a cage, and the trooper tried to pull it out. The dog should have ripped his arm off, and the dog wouldn't even move. The cattle or the horses were very upset that night. It was a very, very interesting case. But what happened? Here's the story. So this woman's in her little cabin home that night, watching TV as normal. She hears this commotion on the little front porch. She had a pile of pop cans out there. Someone was knocking the pop cans around. I think it was like two or three weeks before she had a, a group of uh, wild dogs came through, pack of wild dogs. And she thought, I'll bet those dogs are back. I'll just grab my shotgun and I'll shoot over their head and scare those dogs away. So that's what she was going to do. She grabs her shotgun, loads one chamber. She walks over to the wall, hits the switch to turn on the front porch light. She steps out the door, opens the door, steps out, and there's no dogs. But they're only, I think it was about five to six feet in front of her. It's this huge, great, hair-covered Bigfoot creature with its, as soon as she turned the porch light on, it raises his arms straight up over his head. What does she do? She pulls the trigger and shoots at it and fires right into it. She said there's this bright flash of light, like the, the flash strobe on a camera, and the creature physically disappears right in front of her. Her in-laws lived 100 feet away. They heard the gunshot. They called after what she shot at. She tried to tell them. Her son-in-law grabs his pistol, a sidearm, turns walking down that dark road, says he sees a dark figure running away from him. And as he gets closer, he's surrounded by four or five hairy people with eyes like coals of fire, takes a couple shots at him, runs into the cabin. And soon after, they see this large object, like a big Christmas ornament with different colored lights on it flashing over top of the woods. That's when they called the state police. That was the case that, among others, that convinced me that we're dealing with something that has more than a flesh and blood element to it. And there have been many, many incidents, not only in Pennsylvania, but I've been to researchers throughout the country, even the last couple of years. The same kind of reports are coming in in more recent years. Many people in the Bigfoot field have told me, and from Pennsylvania and other states, that they're going on the areas investigating Bigfoot reports, and they're seeing these strange orbs of light or other type of light phenomena. This is something that's going on more and more around the country. And I believe many people in the field are beginning to become a little more open-minded now. You know, I started writing about this back in the 70s, and there was a lot more ridicule. But... I found out back then that a lot of other Bigfoot people, well-known back in those days, had those kind of reports, but they didn't want to publish those stories because they were afraid of being laughed at by their peers. My position has always been, here's the information I'm gathering. I don't have the answers, but I'm not going to sweep it under the carpet and pretend it's not going on. This is what's going on. I don't have the answers. Well, do you find any direct references, connections, things that are similar? One thing that uh, we found in our notes here with uh, Seth Breedlove's film, Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, uh, and what you're talking about, and your documentary, uh, Kecksburg, The Untold Story, was things like the smell of sulfur around both sightings, uh, strange noises. And uh, do you find any things that are um, kind of a direct connection or, or maybe evidence of like a, a portal opening over the whole region and letting a bunch of weird stuff in? Yeah, I, I've uncovered a lot of similarities of a lot of these cases with Bigfoot and with UFOs. And with Kecksburg, we still don't know for sure what that object was. Yeah. But there, again, there are multitudes of cases. I can give you some examples of some of the really detailed UFO incidents I've been involved with. And not only myself, but there have been many investigators, and historically there have been incidents over the years, both with UFOs but more with Bigfoot. People talk about this very strong overpowering stench that people describe as like rotten eggs or sulfur. However, you do not have a smell in all cases. 
my theory is that we talk about these things, which we don't understand the science behind it. I don't have the answers, but again, being reported by many individuals, that these things, under certain conditions, they come in and out of our physical reality. They can be physically solid at times, they can leave evidence, and they're gone. My belief is that the smell has something to do with that process of them coming from in and out of the reality into our physical reality. So that's just a, a possibility. But there are many, many similarities to a lot of these reports. It's just amazing. And it goes even further because I investigate a lot of other strange reports in Pennsylvania from these giant flying creatures, for a better term, we call Thunderbirds, which have been many, many year after year. The Black Panther reports are very intriguing, more of out-of-place animals, an animal that's not supposed to exist in this part of the world, but people see them year after year, including this year. And there's some very strange elements I found about the Black Panthers that relate to the Bigfoot and other creatures. The more you know about the phenomena, the stranger it is. I said years and years ago, the phenomena is so strange, it protects itself. Right, right. I think it was, again... Your book is called Silent Invasion, right? Silent Invasion, the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot case. Well, yeah, it's out there at uh, Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. I'm going to be looking for that for sure. And then also, uh, you know, as Forrest mentioned, you know, Seth Breedlove is a friend of ours. We had seen inv- Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, which details some of the cases you just mentioned, including the the one with the white-haired Bigfoot carrying the orb of light, and also the other one. There's another story of a creature that was thought to be a Bigfoot lifting up a woman's cabin off the foundation. Yeah, actually, one of the other investigators in my group investigated that. That was down um, outside of Derry Township, outside of Lake Trove. And uh-huh. I don't remember all the details, but I, I recall that he went out there, and she was very, very shook up and said that she had heard the sound and looked out, and this creature was out there, and that actually lifted the one portion of her trailer up. And I believe when he went out, he found some of the big blocks had actually been moved out of place right in the area where she said it uh, it had been lifted up. That was during that wave of 73. Is that the most recent large wave? And and, and this is a two-part question. I um, For some time, I don't have it anymore, but my, my wife and I lived in New York City for almost 10 years, and we used to have a small little house on the Delaware River out in Bucks County, which I understand is also an active area or has been. I know there were Bigfoot sightings out that way. I'd be curious to hear about, you know, any, any information relating to Bucks County, because you're still, you're still coordinating these reports that are coming in to this day in Pennsylvania, right? Yeah. And actually as recent as today and yesterday, where we had some interesting reports coming in, we're still, of course, we're just looking into them. But yeah, I documented right. there about a lot of activity, especially 2018 and 2019. If you go to my website, StanGordon.info, there's a, an interesting report about many of the really strange reports that came in during 2019. Uh-huh. And I mean, we're dealing with things that a lot of people never heard about before. And, and one thing I want to stress, you know, when I talk about these incidents with Bigfoot and UFOs being seen together, I'm not trying to to suggest that Bigfoot is a passenger in a spaceship from another planet. Right. Because right. we don't know for sure what the UFO phenomena represents. Years ago, I, from the data that I was seeing, that we're very likely are dealing with more than one origin to the unknown category. You know, when I started in this as a kid, everything was, these things are all extraterrestrial. But the more I know about the phenomena, that may not be the case. Maybe a small percentage might be extraterrestrial, but we may be dealing with things that we're just beginning to speculate on. Could some of these things be, again, lack of a better term, interdimensional? Could be time travelers, unknown natural phenomena? There is so much involved here. It, it's such a complex phenomena, and it's much more complex than most people realize. The more I know about the phenomena, I believe there's a, there's a correlation between the UFO phenomena, a lot of it, a lot of the cryptid phenomena, and even the paranormal. There's a lot of similarities in these type of reports. And I know in the last few years, you're seeing a lot more cases like this coming to light. You're seeing more books coming out, more documentaries bringing this information out. More and more people are beginning to see that there's something else going on here, which is much more unusual than people realize Well, I think that's a position that Scott and I have come to adopt in a general sense that the more you look into it, the more connections you start to see and the more similarities and you start to be open to this, uh, like you said, so many different ways of connections to 
this high strangeness and what's going on. But I, I want to ask you, when you say the sightings are just as strong, the reports of them are still going on, have you noticed any patterns of the frequency going up or down? Say, if there's a time between flaps, like, is it five years or, or is it always pretty consistent? Well, we've had nothing like the 1973 waves. Mm-hmm. Over the years, there have been some years that were a little more active than others. And again, 2018 and 2019 in particular, not the huge numbers of reports, but mm-hmm. the high quality of the reports coming in. So you're getting not lights in the sky, not just lights in the sky, but you're getting large solid objects or what appear to be solid objects at times, even in daylight being seen. You're getting very close range Bigfoot sightings. I mean, we had an incident down in the Mon Valley outside of Pittsburgh in uh, 2018 where there's been a, a history of all kinds of sightings along the Monongahela River, along the Mon River area. And I mean, this fellow was riding down this rainy, dark night in this two lane farm road. And he had his low beams on and realized there was something standing ahead of him on the left side of the road. He puts his high beams on, moves forward slowly, and this huge seven-foot-tall, huge, hairy Bigfoot literally steps out in front of the road. I mean, five feet in front of his car, standing there in the road, staring at him with glowing red eyes. Mm. And then the interesting part of the story is it was so close to him, you couldn't see the, its arms and legs, the bottoms, because it was so close, to it turned, and then he could see the, the arms swinging and the big stride as it ran up this little embankment to the right. He falls it in his car, loads up his cell phone to try to get a picture of this thing. He goes to take a picture, and he said, it's gone. He said, I don't understand. He said, I know it's dark. I had my, my headlights on. It was in front of me, but it's gone. He had no idea where it went to. Mm. These are the kind of things you're getting. I had another couple in February of 2019. Couple going to work early in the morning. This huge hairy Bigfoot suddenly, as as the one woman told me, who's caught the best view of it, she said it was like watching a predator movie. She said this thing suddenly appears out of nowhere. It walks in front of our vehicle. I see it from head to toe in great detail, and it disappears. It's gone. Mm. Those are the kind of things that are going on more and more. You keep getting these reports of footprints. In fact, Seth has a great video. He has uh, got permission to use it because the people that contacted me, this was in January of 2018 in North Huntington, PA, here in Westmoreland County, where we get a lot of reports. It had been a heavy snow. They looked out the next morning, and here's a series of these very large footprints with a huge stride between them went across their yard and the tracks came over to the children's playground and the tracks suddenly stopped, vanished, and disappeared. And you can see those tracks in his documentary on the trail of of Bigfoot. Hmm. So a lot of this stuff is still going on. But to answer your question again, I got off the track. I get reports all year round. Even now with the virus going on, I'm surprised how many reports are still coming in. Hmm. It goes on all year round in all types of weather conditions. And you've got to look at the phenomena. I mean, you look at the space launch was supposed to go off yesterday, but just like we used to have years and years ago. How many times were our launches halted temporarily because of weather conditions? Well, how many UFO reports have we had over the years in beautiful afternoons, during snowstorms, during rainstorms? They appear and disappear under all kinds of conditions. We're dealing with something that's far more sophisticated than what we're dealing with. Right. When you say that the quality of the reports are increasing and the frequency is fairly consistent, do you think we're becoming more interactive with this phenomenon? That maybe we're, I don't know, heading towards something? Well, I I can't say that it's increasing in numbers year after year because it varies year to year. Sometimes Mm -hmm. you get more, sometimes you get less, but we still get good interesting reports you could not easily dismiss. For example, just like with the UFO phenomena we're dealing with, some of the cases I worked on appear to be solid physical craft objects. In some cases, there's some different elements to them. And I've had incidents where these things suddenly appear out of nowhere. They physically change physical form. They suddenly appear and disappear. I've had incidents over many years ago. There was a a group of people, one case where only a couple people within the group could see this large object covering over top of them, but other people couldn't see it. We had numerous reports, 2018, 2019, of large, solid 
cigar-shaped objects being reported. Some were metallic, but there was one case in particular, um, I'm trying to remember, it was 2018, 2019. Anyhow, it's in daylight. There's this very large solid object hovering in the sky, making no sound, and suddenly, from the one end of it, it begins to suddenly fade, 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 until the whole complete object disappears in front of the witness. And there's many reports like this. That's what I'm saying. We may be dealing with something that it's much more unusual that any of us really understand or realize. And I'm very much convinced that our government does indeed know a lot more about UFOs, probably Bigfoot as well, from what I've learned over the years, but they don't have the answer themselves. I wanted to ask you about, there was one particular case in Seth's film that really jumped out at me. It was an August 2015 sighting with uh, Dwayne Pentoff and Eric Altman, where they were doing a Bigfoot investigation and they saw a light in the woods. Uh, do you know about this case? Yeah, I don't have all the details, but I know they both saw it. And again, they're among numerous other Bigfoot investigators, not only in Pennsylvania, but around the country. They're reporting the same type of thing. Yeah. So it, it, they had said that the, it, at first it looked like someone carrying a lantern or it was a balloon on a balloon or something, or and then Dwayne compared it to a lava lamp, and then with it, when it was within sixty feet of them, I guess they lit it up with a five hundred lumen spotlight, and then a portal, <laughs> a window they described that was I think one dimensional in essence, opened up and it went into the window, which then closed. And the reason that this jumped out at me is because there was an identical, almost identical event described during the observations that were made at Skinwalker Ranch out in Utah. It seems like this observation of some kind of doorway to another, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, people say dimension, that's the easiest word to go to, time, space, somewhere else, where this this ball of light went into it and then it closed, almost like a bad special effect in a movie. Have you have seen ca more yeah. cases like that where people are reporting similar things, like these portals, where they're actually witnessing the portal? There have been incidents I've looked into over the years. I've heard reports up on the Ridge area, uh, things similar to that. Uh, about for many reports of the light phenomena. So here's something else I've looked into, which relates to a lot of this. And again, a lot of people are not aware of this. Since the 1960s, I've investigated multitudes of what I call mini UFO reports. These are generally size-wise anywhere from a few inches, about one to two foot in diameter. Most spherical, but not all of them are. Some are just bright light sources of various colors. Some are metallic. These things, whatever they might be, and they appear to be intelligently controlled, they've come very close to people, never hurt anybody. I've had many cases where they've entered people's homes and vehicles through open windows. They floated around and went back out, or they went right through the walls of the house. I had one case several years ago, a beautiful afternoon up near State College, where a fellow was uh, riding down the road in his truck, pretty good speed, had his passenger window down and noticed this spherical object pacing his vehicle. It enters into his cabin of the truck. It moves all around, it comes right up to his legs, moves around, and goes right through the bed of the truck and disappears. I had a, a case many, many years ago, I remember, from up near Punxsutawney, PA, the home of Punxsutawney Hill, <laughs> where a woman told me that she was cooking in a kitchen one morning when one of these little spheres came through the window. It's floating around in the kitchen. She grabs her broom, starts striking it, <laughs> says they're broken. The two identical little spheres, they floated back out the window and were gone. Wow. Even in the in the last few months, I've had reports of this and other very similar and very strange of uh, these smaller objects, including there was one that uh, one of my associate researchers, Jim Brown, up in Fayette County along the Ridge area again, I believe it was, last year had an incident that he investigated. I believe it's on my website, too. But anyhow, this actually occurred in November of 2019. And the fellow is outside a, a Mason Town, PA, and he's riding up this road to go home. And he comes over the rise in the road, and he sees this ball in the road just sitting there. And this is in daylight. It was about two feet across and was blocking the road. So he had to stop, and he couldn't get by the road without this thing being moved. So he actually stops his car, trying to figure out what to do. And he thought, this thing is so strange. Maybe I'll go over and pick it up and take it home. But when he opened the car door, it started to physically just fade away and disappeared in a few seconds. 
So we just covered a case you may or may not be familiar with called the Kira object, which occurred in Japan in 1972. So it's around that same time about a strange anomalous object that could be described as a micro UFO uh, that had interaction with this group of kids. So you're saying is that type of small object that kind of comes and goes and disappears seems to be still going on, that we're still having visitations from small machines. And I guess here's my question. Are there other types of weird, let's say, strange machinery that are not what would be classified as UFOs? But I've heard so many stories from people about just strange anomalous machines appearing and then disappearing. I'll tell you when I looked into just a couple of years ago, and this again is uh, in Fayette County, but this is down around the Mon Valley area again we talked about where there's a lot of activity. This occurred in October 2017. The fellow involved, it, it was a cold morning, and he was got up early to warm up his wife's car so she could go to work, and he's walking down the steps towards the driveway, and he looks towards her car, and he sees something 10 to 12 feet away from him by the right bumper. So it's all illuminated, the whole place is lit up. The lights are on, the area around the car was well illuminated. He said he sees this object, he said it was really hard to describe. It's about two feet tall and shaped like a haystack. He said it was translucent and shiny and milky white in color. There were like vertical ribs that seemed to be super structured that looked like chrome straws that could be seen through the translucent structure. The object would completely be silent, gliding about one to two inches off the ground, but it was motionless when he first saw it. And he said, whatever the thing was, he said, after several seconds, he thinks it probably must have detected him as he was getting close to it. And he said, he got to about six feet away from it. And he said, suddenly, it suddenly um, zoomed very fast across the driveway to the left side of the car then made a perfect right angle turn in the darker area down toward the driver's side of the car, and that was it. Never saw it again. Wow. <laughs> and there's so many cases, it's unbelievable. And can you imagine how much is going on out there? I don't hear about, others don't hear about. Everywhere I go to speak, people come up to me and tell me about the incidents they've had. 99% of them never reported it to anybody. And other researchers are getting reports. So can you imagine how much of this activity is taking place, which we never hear about? And, mm -hmm. you know, the media for years now, last year, has been focusing on, on the Navy videos, which is great. Right. There have been multitudes of sightings by military personnel. I've interviewed many of them over the years from all the different services. But they're concentrating on that. But what they're not, people aren't realizing is you have these ongoing reports going on all the time around the country, around the world. I have hundreds of cases I worked on in Pennsylvania of these large objects being seen even over populated areas. Sightings near Philadelphia, Harrisburg, downtown Pittsburgh, on the turnpike. Multiple reports of these things being seen. And some of these cases are not easily dismissed. I'm sure that everyone within the sound of my voice right now is dealing with challenges related to the unpredictability of our current times. Oh, yeah. And that's on top of all the normal stresses in life that can slow down our progress. And I can assure you that from time to time, we've all felt like there's a dark cloud hanging over us and we don't know where to turn for help. If there's something interfering with your happiness or, or preventing you from achieving your goals, it's time to check out BetterHelp.com. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. Look, you may find yourself in an area that doesn't offer certain mental health services, or maybe you don't want to sit in a small waiting room and expose yourself to risk right now, which is completely understandable. However, that shouldn't hinder you from getting the counseling you want and deserve. And I want to be clear that BetterHelp is not a crisis hotline, and it's not self-help either. They offer professional counseling done securely online. Whatever you're dealing with, there's a broad range of expertise available from BetterHelp. BetterHelp is convenient and private. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you have the opportunity to schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. Switching counselors is easy and free. If you're concerned about the expense of seeing a private counselor, well, this is more affordable than the traditional in-person counseling, and financial aid is available for those who need it. BetterHelp is professional, affordable, convenient, and most of all, it's effective. 
and they want you to start living a happier life today. So take a moment or two to visit their website and read their testimonials. For example, after just two months of using BetterHelp, Laura wrote this about her counselor. She understands key themes and issues in my life and helps me work through those with objective guidance and kindness. Visit betterhelp.com slash A-L. That's better, H-E-L-P. Join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. There's a very special offer for Astonishing Legends listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash A-L. Better, H-E-L-P dot com slash A-L. I gotta say that although I love all the new capabilities our mobile devices can accomplish, it, it really frustrates me to no end that the data storage capacity, whether it's iOS or Android, doesn't seem to be keeping up with the advancements, especially the newer ones. So many of us are taking high definition photos and videos with our phones, and we're shooting 4K video all the time, and of course, downloading more apps than ever. I, I love my apps, don't get me wrong, but I shouldn't be running out of storage so quickly or having to wait for important media to back up to the cloud. Well, for you and I, there's no question about it. Our phones are an important part of how we produce the show, especially when we travel or schedule remote interviews, which is why you and I trust, and I mean trust, SanDisk memory cards, not only to free up space, but to store important media that we can't afford to lose. Yeah, make no mistake, long before we started this show, SanDisk was the brand we, as professionals working in post-production, used for all kinds of storage. In fact, before they even sponsored the show, it was a SanDisk card we used on our digital handheld mic to get the Bob Gimlin interview. Because if that WAV file got corrupted or didn't work, well, that would be that. We, we may never see Bob again, so that's why we relied on SanDisk. Yeah, they're the only ones we use for any digital device we have. Like, I use the Extreme Micro SDXC UHS-1 card with a card adapter and our Zoom audio recorder, so it's super convenient to swap into any device that has a standard or micro card slot. Plus, you don't want to lose that Class A EVP or disembodied groan because it ain't going to happen again on cue. And if you have an Android device with a USB port, you can get the Ultra Dual Drive Lux USB Type-C flash drive so your precious data and memories are safe and sound. And for those of you with an iPhone or an iPad with a lightning port, the iExpand Flash Drive Go is going to do the trick and do it quite well. There are lots of options, including ones that range from 32 gigabytes up to one terabyte of storage. And these cards are super fast, like up to 160 megabytes per second read speeds fast. There's nothing worse than missing something because you're waiting for data to transfer. Trust us, you need SanDisk for your mobile devices too. SanDisk is the easiest and safest way to free up space and protect your important data. Right now, our listeners get 10% off their first order of these featured SanDisk products, but only when you go to sandisk.com slash legends. That's S-A-N-D-I-S-K dot com slash legends. Don't wait. Sandisk.com slash legends. Hi, this is Scott from BC, Canada, and when I'm not obsessively re-watching old episodes of Lost, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Now, back to the show. Let me ask you a question about something that we haven't touched on necessarily so far in this discussion. We had a, a interviewed a gentleman from the Colorado area who was a, a Bigfoot researcher named Chuck Zukowski a while back. Yeah. And one of the things that he talked about or alluded to was some violent interactions between Bigfoot and uh, witnesses. Have, have you heard any stories like that in, in, your, yeah. in your region? What would be called a rogue Bigfoot, I think, in, in the parlance. Okay. Well, I can just tell you, of the hundreds of Bigfoot cases I've investigated, and many of these were close-range, very detailed reports, I've not seen any indication as such that these things harmed anybody, even though they easily could have if they wanted to. Many people, many hunters have told me these things, with their huge size, their huge stride, how fast they were, they easily could have outran them and hurt them if they wanted to. That hasn't been the case. Now, I've had numerous reports of these things, at times throwing large rock at you like small boulders. In some cases, a human couldn't even lift some of these, and they projected them very easily through the air in their direction or large branches as though to scare them out of their territory. As people said to me, if they really wanted to hit us, they easily could have done it. That in itself was very unusual. But uh, for these things to be aggressive any further than that, I have no cases that I can think of that I can confirm like that. 
Well, here's something that also appears in Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, which I thought was one of the more chilling accounts that you possibly have a connection to, and that is the story of Barry Clark, who was investigating, I believe, with you or, or in conjunction with you. And he had a, you could say, really negative experience, which got him to stop investigating altogether. Uh, could you tell us about that? Well, I I remember uh, some of those incidents. I don't remember a lot of details of going back so many years ago. I right. have to review right. the files. But I have talked to Barry even in the last year or so. And Barry was a very experienced outdoorsman. He got involved in a lot of the investigations. And there were some reoccurring incidents on a couple farms out in Barry Township during that 73 outbreak. And we tried to stake them out. I remember one of the persons on that farm had brought up at that time as we're just beginning to learn about these strange elements with the Bigfoot. And they would talk about the screams this thing made, the chilling screams, people actually seeing the creature on the property. And this one person mentioned, they said, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but very soon after we would see or hear the creature, these strange luminous objects, these objects would appear. Thing one was kind of like a reddish flare kind of elongated would illuminate the ground when it passed over so they were bringing these things up but there was i remember it was one incident of barry and some other witnesses had observed a very strange ufo incident this might have been the one at the bell farm i think yeah and um, yeah. uh of course it's a pseudonym and um oh of course <laughs> so but it anyhow <laughs> uh, there were some strange things that went on there and there were some things that i believe barry was unnerved about and uh he just decided to get out of it at that point because one of the things he had mentioned in in Seth's film too was that he was concerned about his grandson having uh now having sort of strange high strangeness happen with him and he's worried that there was a connection and you know, I actually wrote down a quote that he said, he said, it's quite scary when it happens to yourself. Nice to read about it when it happens to someone else, but when it's really your life, it's a whole nother thing. Well, there's many, many strange accounts. I mean, we've been talking now for quite a while. We haven't even begun to touch on so much that's going on over the years. So many amazing cases. I mean, if I had been involved in this personally, it'd be very difficult for me to be able to accept a lot of what's going on. But when you talk to so many credible people, especially when you're you were out on the scene, interview these people within a short time after it happened, and you see the emotion, you see the response, how people's lives were affected. And many of these people I kept in touch with years later, and I saw how their lives had been changed because of their experience. Even the last few years, some of the hunters and people I've interviewed who have encountered UFOs and strange creatures, I mean, these people's lives are changed. These are people who never would have believed these things could occur, so they had their own encounter. And it's just amazing that they hear the stories and see the emotion of what they've been dealing with. And what you're saying, that's something that we've learned, too, uh, since we started our show, which, you know, we've not been at it nearly as long as you. But I really feel like, again, going back to something that we mentioned earlier, the fact that you captured all those interviews back in the 90s with those folks, I mean, I was just absolutely mesmerized by their sincerity and the intensity of what they were saying. And the fact that you got it that much closer or more contemporaneously with the events as they experienced them. But, you know, I challenge anybody to watch those and tell me or anyone else that all those folks are lying. It's just not plausible to me once you watch them tell their stories. Sure, maybe, you know, as an eyewitness, maybe you get some details wrong. But you can't say that uh, 100% of what they're saying is misinterpreted. You know, maybe some details aren't right, but it's clear that they are struck by whatever they experienced. And my hat's off to you for having uh, captured those people on film when you did. Yes, and, and not just with Kexburg, but with so many of these other cases. You know, in many instances, there's other people who don't even know each other that were confirming other people's reports. It's the little details and the similarity and the patterns you keep seeing over the years. And that's what made it so interesting to me over the years that I was finding things I wasn't expecting to find and turn up. And so many people would tell you the same account. One thing I did want to mention, because I don't think we mentioned this while we talked today, a pattern I found years and years ago, and it's still ongoing as recent as the last couple, last couple of days, many close-range, low-level, detailed UFO sightings and encounters with Bigfoot and other cryptids, other strange creatures, commonly occur in the vicinity of high-energy sources. Multitudes of reports around high-tension power lines, power stations, Railroad tracks, radio towers, gas wells, gas lines, reservoirs, goes on and on and on. I have no doubt that a lot of phenomena somehow is energy-related. 
And is there a connection to water, uh, rivers, streams, lakes? Oh, yeah. Well, again, many, and there have been actually reports of Bigfoot in the water. Ah. A lot of people don't know that. There have been reports of these things in the water and under the water. <laughs> Another phenomenon I deal with, I wrote about my, my last book, Astonishing uh, Encounters, Pennsylvania's Unknown Creek, and again, all kind of cryptid and strange reports, and some of the strange water aquatic creatures are seeing. And here's the whole point. I've looked into all these reports of, of the Thunderbirds, the Black Panthers, other strange, very strange cryptid reports coming in the last few years. And the witnesses I'm talking to, 99% of them want no publicity. They have nothing to gain. Many of them are reluctant to even talk to me or anybody about it. And you've got so many reputable people who are seeing these things. The point is, though, it's impossible. You can't have so many types of unknown creatures being out there. It makes no sense. But you can't dismiss the report because you've got so many credible people with the patterns. So there's got to be something else we're doing which we don't understand yet. And again, the only thing is possible from what I can see is that we're dealing with phenomena that under certain conditions comes into our physical reality. They see it. It leaves evidence and it's gone. It comes and it goes. In the realm of paranormal high strangeness uh, with uh, cryptids, lizard people, dogmen, uh, all these types of creatures, Bigfoots. The story from Barry Clark, his account, sounded to me, it had it had undertones of a spiritual or something to, having to do with the supernatural as opposed to maybe some more stuff that was could be considered more paranormal. And that what he experienced sounded to me a lot like what somebody might say was a ghost encounter or a or a, a negative spirit. Have you encountered stories that lean more towards something that's more supernatural or spiritual or having to do with ghosts or or specters or things like that? All I can tell you is this. Over the years I've been doing this and come in contact with multitudes of people, there are some people actually from probably over 40 years ago that I'm still in contact with today. And some of these people, from the time they were very young, they began to have different types of unusual experiences. Some dealt with paranormal phenomena, uh, apparitions, ghosts, poltergeist activity. Some of them had missing time. And later during their lives, they began to have encounters with UFOs, some with cryptids, Bigfoot, and other phenomena. Some of them, however, later their children began to have experiences, and then their grandchildren. I mean, I'm still in touch with one person today from years and years ago. She was missing. She was a young child at the time. She was missing. There was a big search for her. They found her in the middle of a big field that they had searched for over and over again. She had no idea she was missing. She said she was there the entire time. She's had multiple incidents ongoing for years and years, and other people were with her to confirm these reports. This phenomena, once again, I'm probably repeating myself, it's much stranger than anybody imagines can imagine. Mm -hmm. And nobody has the answers, but the more I look into it, once again, I think that a lot of these phenomena somehow are interconnected. We just don't understand it yet. Right. Do you think that these people, once they experience something, that uh, they are now somehow connected to the phenomenon, and that's why years later or throughout the rest of their lives, strange things happen to them or... Was there some connection beyond that? Are they themselves connected before they even had their first experience? What I began to notice years and years ago when six cases were appearing, and I'm interviewing so many people, it seemed to me that some of these people suggested or believed they had certain abilities that they were able to perceive certain phenomena that other people could not. And it may well be that they they had a certain capability that they were able to do this, or Maybe the phenomenon was attracted to them for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, now that you've been compiling this information for decades and decades, I mean, do you have a system in place for preserving it? Are you backing it up as per, you know, I'm sure a lot of it's on paper, maybe not digital, but are you preparing to like pass the mantle? Are you training people to step in as you said, you're the sensei, you're aging out, maybe, who knows, or people that can come along? Because you talked about, how Stanton was older than you, and I think someone it's important for someone to come along and you know pick up the torch what do you have plans for that and what is any of your database of information and reports is it searchable or is it available online or is it all just in file cabinets and you know it's and I know that's a daunting task by the way when you're compiling as much information as you are what's your position on all of that well i I've written about a lot of this stuff over the years there's 
a lot of interesting cases on my website, but yes, there's many other cases that I have uh, filed away and in storage, and I've had different thoughts on this and how we're going to do this, and uh, there's a number of younger researchers today that uh, are very involved, I've been in touch with for a long time, and hopefully they'll carry on, but we're still trying to work out some plans. Right. I think that future generations would love to be able to access everything you've been compiling, because there's just so few people doing what you're doing, and to be able to look for patterns and reports and find all that information, you know, and we've had a few things... uh, gigabytes of information, uh, audio recordings from paranormal investigations dumped in our laps that we have just sitting on servers and don't even have time to listen to. And like even the people that were doing the investigations, because they go into a house and they take like five cameras and four tape recorders and whatever else. And then when they finish the investigation, there's like 75 hours of stuff to go through and they go through about 10% of it. And then they got to move on because they're on to their next thing. So I have a compulsive nature. So I'm just like, ah, we have all this stuff sitting around. I want to go through it. I want to review it. I want to catalog it. And, you know, but you can spend your whole life doing that. And then, but you, meanwhile, you've got new reports coming in and it's hard to figure out what to flag and how to compile it. So I always ask that question, somebody in your position. It's been a lifetime venture. And yes, there's, there's so much great information. I've tried to bring a lot of the important cases already out publicly, I've written three books about it, and I have a fourth one I'm working on now. But that's what I've been doing since I was in high school. Out of high school, I began to give lectures to various groups about the phenomena, and I've been doing it ever since. And, uh, I mean, there's a huge interest, especially in this area of Western PA. There's a, I have a, a lot of people who are very uh, interested in testing with a subject around here, and uh, I think more and more people are now becoming much more aware that there are definitely phenomena out there which we just still don't understand. Yeah. Is there a, an area outside of Pennsylvania that interests you just as much that you would love to have the time to fully research and, and make connections to? Well, you know, again, going back to the 70s, I, I was in touch with many of the well-known researchers of that time period throughout the country. And there was a lot of activity going on in different parts of the country that had mm-hmm. similar phenomena going on. I mean, I've always had an interest in the Skinwalker Ranch, too, because it mm-hmm. was similar to what I had been writing about in the 1970s that was going on here. But I also knew that there were other places around the country, uh, in California and Oregon, um, I'm trying to think, uh, Illinois, Ohio, other areas where things were being reported that were showing similarities to what I was finding. And there are indeed other places around the country, and even here in Pennsylvania, where similar phenomena, for whatever reason, seems to focus on a particular geographical area for whatever reason. A lot of this phenomena is sporadic. It can happen almost anywhere. But you have places like along areas of the Chestnut Ridge and other areas where, for whatever reason, the phenomena seems to focus on and becomes active. Sometimes it lasts weeks, days, months, or years. We had an ongoing series of events back here in Westmoreland County back, oh, summer 1979 through about 1982 with many people involved on the Armstrong County, Westmoreland County border. Trying to remember from memory, but involved some type of an object falling from the sky into a wooded area one afternoon. And soon after, people around the area began to hear screams and cries and find strange footprints, reported Bigfoot sightings, UFOs, Black Panther sightings, All kind of stuff went on for months into years, and it actually made the local news, radio, and TV. And that's just an example. There's another location going on currently uh, in Fayette County for the last few years where the same kind of phenomenon is ongoing, and numerous people have experienced it. So there are certain areas where this phenomenon continues to occur, and it's going on sporadically in many different locations. Well, Stan, I just... I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and spending your time with us. I guess in this, as we wrap this up, I, <laughs> what I'm struck by is how much information you've collected and how many times you say, well, I'm not going to go into detail on that right now because you've got so much in the back of your mind and probably stuff that hasn't been verified yet and all of that. Are there, is there any kind of overarching message or idea that, you know, after all these years of looking at all of this, I mean, you, you've really spoken your mind on everything over the course of the past several hours of our interview with you, but is there is there any overarching concept that seems to be coming through for you right now at this particular moment in time with regard to a, a connection between all of the types of reports that you're constantly fielding? 
All I can say is for researchers out there, I know many people going back years ago, many people in the Bigfoot field did not want to associate Bigfoot with UFOs and vice versa. But more and more people in these fields are beginning to receive these reports. They're not, they're, some of them becoming part of these reports. Uh, I knew many years ago that many researchers had these kind of cases, but they didn't want to publish them because they're afraid of being ridiculed and laughed at. All I can do is tell people out there, keep an open mind. No matter what kind of case you're dealing with, whether it's a UFO or Bigfoot or even not even the subject matter, you've got to look at all the different patterns. You've got to look at all the data that you're receiving. And even if it's strange and unusual, you just can't dismiss us on that. You've got to collect the data and compare it to other reports. And when you see the similarities from all over the country and around the world, you've got to realize there's something out there going on. It's so unusual and so beyond our present science, we just don't understand it yet. I think that's a pretty good wrap up. I, I really, I just, I thank you so much for taking the time to uh, talk to us for so long today. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And if people want to go to my website, it's stangordon.info. My three books are available on amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com as well. Great. And we'll have, we'll find links to all of those and include them in the show notes for our listeners. Thanks again. Uh, stay safe and um, let's stay in touch. And by the way, reach out to us if you have some interesting case that comes up and you want to come and talk about it on the show. We would uh, we'd love to have you back on. Well, thanks very much. And I'm sure someday down the road we can probably schedule and do that. It should be no surprise to anyone that good health starts with, well, good habits. And the trick is starting the good habits in the first place. Easier said than done, right? Well, for example, let's talk about brushing your teeth. And I don't mean just brushing your teeth. I'm talking about an effective daily routine that promotes better oral hygiene. It really is one of those things we can sometimes overlook, you know, until you're facing an unexpected bill for a root canal or a deep Ooh. cleaning, which, by the way, I've had those. They are unpleasant. They're so bad that they offer to do those in two visits. But I usually go for the one if I have to do it. Because you're you're like Rick Moranis in The Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good, good reference. But I'll tell you what, since I've had Quip, I haven't had to do that. Let's talk about what's special about getting Quip oral care delivered to your home. Well, you and I can say with confidence that Quip makes it very easy to establish a dentist-recommended routine by delivering all the oral care essentials you need to brush and floss regularly and more effectively. It's one less thing you have to venture out to get at the store, and right now, that's healthy in itself, which is why we use it, and you should too. So why does the Quip work so well to promote good habits? Well, first, your Quip electric toothbrush has timed sonic vibrations to guide you through a dentist-recommended two-minute routine. Secondly, the anti-cavity toothpaste, floss refills, and a new Quip brush head are automatically delivered to your door every three months for just $5 each. Think of it as a friendly reminder that it's time to refresh and stay on top of your routine, and shipping is free. Quip isn't a gimmick either. It won't wind up at the garage sale alongside your potty putter. <laughs> wait, wait a second, what? You're, you're the potty putter. It's it's a little putting green for when you go no, to the... <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Yeah, wait, okay. That's not a... Is that a real thing? Yeah, it's real. It's totally real. <laughs> I have one. It's right over here. <laughs> hey, let's just say that Quip is an impressive product and is one of the first electric toothbrushes accepted by the American Dental Association. Quip has literally thousands of verified five-star reviews. And there's even a size-down version for kids. So join Forrest and I, along with over 3 million other happy customers, and practice good oral care easily and affordably with Quip, starting at only $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash legends right now, you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash legends. Spelled get Q U I P dot com slash legends quip the good habits company here's the thing about home security companies most trap you with high prices tricky contracts and lousy customer support so while there are a lot of options out there there's only one no-brainer simply safe u.s news and world report named simply safe the best overall home security of 2020 and for very good reasons Simply Safe can blanket your home with an arsenal of security cameras and sensors, whatever you need, whatever you require. Glass break detection, video security, smoke detection, freeze and flood sensors. They got you covered. Well, here's my little secret. When I got my Simply Safe system, I of course wanted to set it up so we could talk about it on the show, even though I already had a built-in alarm system here at my new house in North Carolina. 
Thing is, it was so easy to set up in just under an hour, and then so much more user-friendly and easier to use that I've actually stopped using the elaborate and overpriced system that was already here. And that system, which is also supposed to work with my phone, just doesn't. It never has. Their app is clunky, and it's unable to connect most of the time. I have not had one single issue, though, with Simply Safe. Also, the professional and reliable monitoring service is continuous day and night, ready to send police, fire, or medical personnel anytime there's trouble. No kidding around, Simply Safe can secure every window, door, and room without any of the drawbacks like pushy salesmen and ridiculous contracts. Just honest and straightforward security for your home. Simply Safe is easy to set up and easy to use, and it all starts at just 15 bucks a month. So, try Simply Safe today at simplysafe.com slash AL. You get free shipping and a 60-day risk-free trial. There's nothing to lose. That's simplysafe.com slash AL. This is Stuart in Oxford, England. And when I'm not going from college to college searching for Victorian ghosts, I listen to Astonishing Legends. Now let's get back to the show. Well, I'll tell you what, I was just completely captivated and also it so much left me wanting. Like for everything, he was like, oh, that's an amazing story. Uh, we can talk about that. There's numerous reports of that. There's just all this stuff. You can just tell he's like a font of information. And there's yeah. probably just these amazing stories in his catalog and in his files. And that's why I was asking about that. It's like, are these all in file cabinets? What's happening? We got to get this stuff <laughs> scanned, and digitized, and, and written out on spreadsheets, and comparisons need to be made. Okay, so what he was saying is we did kind of point that uh, question towards him towards the end here, as you all heard, in that it's been culled together in his three books. So there is record of it. Yes. It's the greatest hits. I've already bought one of them. I'm about to buy the other three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So again, uh, those are on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and uh, we'll have links in the uh, the book section. Uh, you can click on those; it'll take them right to them. But here's the other point about these stories, Scott. In his books, and in much shorter form, of course, he does interviews like this, or he appears in films like he did in uh, Seth Breedlove's Small Town Monsters documentaries. Is that you're getting the greatest hits? But the other thing that Stan was saying that I gleaned from all this is that. What makes the greatest hit? It's like the, the stories he just told us where it was a, like a little story of a of a sequence of very strange events, whether it's uh, people seeing this, you know, 100 foot diameter glowing orb come down 100 feet into a half dome resting in this farmer's pasture and somebody actually shooting at it and getting a reaction, actually not hurting it, but getting a reaction and multiple people seeing this and it being investigated and the glow still being there when law enforcement showed up. Yeah, and he said that one witness said he could have read a newspaper by the glow. Yeah, I mean, that alone would have been freaky to experience. Yeah, that's a, a greatest hit because all this stuff happened in one evening and it unfolds into a story. But you may have a story where only a tiny thing happened, but it's very significant and weird. Yeah. But it doesn't make it into a greatest hit. It's like, okay, four or five people came across this field and for 30 seconds, there was a giant glowing half dome and it faded. And it's like, well, that's pretty weird. But it didn't have shaggy Bigfoots coming out of it. Yeah. With glowing eyes or running towards it or, or a light uh, beam coming down into the woods where they where they ran into it. So out of all these stories, there are elements that are pretty fascinating, but they don't make up a whole story. You know, it's kind of like the problem that you and I face when we go to cover a subject. Somebody might have an interesting anecdote or tell us about something strange or we've just heard about it. We, we research it, but it's not quite a full episode. Yeah. Yeah. You can't get a lot of mileage out of it, even though it's very strange, but you're left with more questions after you hear what happened and the strange details. So out of the body of Stan's work here and all the data he's collected and, and all the people that have helped and collaborated, what I'm saying is the matrix of all these weird things interacting. And that's where you find the patterns embedded in them. And that's the bigger picture story, but they're all really fascinating. So yeah, I, I agree. It's like that all has to be tracked and, and mapped out somehow. And the red yarn fully extended to all these strange points, uh, these miraculous kind of points that are happening here. And there's no real way to deal with this, but I guess it's like yeah. when you have these small little stories where, like you said, it's a small little thing, but it's a very unusual event 
that should be studied and analyzed, but it's something that just happened to one person who mm-hmm. was off in the woods by themselves or on their land by themselves late at night. And a lot of those cases I'm with Stan, you know, they aren't probably aren't getting reported. Oh, yeah. People just are like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to tell anybody about that or, or whatever. I've I got to get the cows into the other field. That was right. weird, but I've got to get on with my life. I got to make a living, <laughs> I, you know. But those ones that are getting reported, and then maybe they get discounted because if it's just one person saying, hey, look, I saw a hairy Bigfoot braiding another Bigfoot's hair in the woods. It's like, okay, <laughs> that is super weird. But, you know, that's old Joe. He's kind of weird. He has a six pack every afternoon, you know. And so right. then you're like, you just discount it. And sometimes I wonder how many stories get lost in that because it's like the Kelly Hopkinsville thing, which is, by the way, in this area. <laughs> mm-hmm. And when mm-hmm. the uh, skeptical investigators just, oh, it's a bunch of old boozing rednecks and yeah. they didn't know what they were seeing. It's just owls. You know, again, here we are. Don't get me started on that. The sandhill crane <laughs> and the owls and whatever. It's like like people who live mostly outside don't know what a bird looks like. But right. um, <laughs> well, you no, know, what you're saying though, and I get this. And, and look, this is what Stan said uh, towards the top of this segment. Yeah, most of these things can be probably explained by mundane, prosaic explanations that are totally natural that were misidentified. Yeah, especially with aerial phenomenon. I think maybe less so with stuff on the ground. But then there's some of it, like he said, it's like I've heard this about cattle mutilations as well. Somebody, uh, I think it was, was it Gabe Vasquez? I'm trying to think of the, uh, there's an officer, a police officer in Colorado. His father was on the job collecting these reports and actually investigating them. And then the uh, the son, uh, who's also a uh, law enforcement officer, wrote a book about it. And I remember the the summation of that was that 80, 90% of these things could possibly be explained by predators or natural causes. But there's always that small percentage, which is, this is so weird, so bizarre, so documented, and such evidence that it would be ridiculous to ignore this. Gabe Valdez, Valdez. That's yeah. it, right, Gabe yeah. Valdez. And, and, uh, and you, you know, at, at some point it's ridiculous to say it was a predator or whatever, because that doesn't even fit the bill scientifically of, of, of what happened, uh, you know, to this carcass. And so there is that very small percentage where you can't ignore this. You shouldn't ignore this. And it's impossible to explain this away rationally from everything that we know. So that's what's out there. I like what you're saying is that, yeah, there's a million stories out there. Probably a lot of them are misidentifications or yeah. misunderstandings. But, you know, once you peel that away and you take the chaff away, what you're left with are these kernels of, of real things happening. And so that's what I think Stan has been trying to do. And it's a lot of work, like Stan said, since he was a teenager, he's fielded calls for the UFO study group coming in. And, you know, sometimes phones ring off the hook and you have to take a report seriously and weed out where people were well-meaning. You get some crackpots, certainly. Some people were well-meaning, but uh, weren't really sure what they saw. And out of that, then, you know, you're left with things that uh, are truly high strangeness. And from those, maybe only 10% of those are getting reported. Yeah. And there was a lot of things that stood out about this. And for me, and there's some connections I wanted to make. One of them I thought was interesting that he kept mentioning is that a lot of sightings were in broad daylight at close range, which makes it less likely that you're making a mistake in identification or that you're confused about what you're Mm -hmm. seeing. The other thing he pointed out was that footage of those steps in the snow and that Seth had in On the Trail of Bigfoot that just stop. And that is something that's come up before. And Stan keeps mentioning it's like there's Bigfoot tracks and you follow them and then they just stop. And in fresh snow, that's quite something because let's say you're doing the old thing where you've got, you know, you put the strap in a fake foot to your foot. So you walk out in the snow to the end and then what are you going to do? You're going to have to walk backwards perfectly in the footprints to where you started because now you're, you're really messing with people's minds as a hoaxer. And sure, there's probably people that can do that. But also the sophisticated trackers can tell when a footprint has been stepped in twice or when someone's walking backwards. Right. So there's a lot of interesting things there. And I told you this the other day, Forrest, I watched on Amazon, mm-hmm. Missing 411, The Hunted, which is the movie, yeah. uh, one of the films that comes from uh, David Pauliti's stuff. The Missing 411, which lots of people have wanted us to investigate. And we are aware of those stories and Mr. Pauliti's work. But one of the things that was interesting to me about The Hunted, which you can get right now on Amazon and you should watch it. It's very, very well produced if this is something you're interested in, about people disappearing and mostly in national parks. And that particular angle of that film, because he's covered lots of different cases, centers on hunters. 
who are very experienced people out in the woods who've had these series of strange stories. And that, again, that's a greatest hits film because that's what you do if you're Mr. Paulides. He's got hundreds of stories. He's picking some Mm -hmm. of the really weirdest ones and, and putting them into a movie. And that part where people disappear and turn up miles and miles away, oftentimes dead, or their remains are found, but not for a very long time, or there's evidence that they were there for a good while before they died and just hanging out. Like in one of the stories in that film, there's a guy who's like, it was clear he had sat down on a rock and had a cup of coffee in sight of a house that he could have walked to if he was in distress. Mm -hmm. But instead they found his body. When you think about all this interdimensional stuff that Stan was hinting at and this topic that has been laughed at about, you know, Bigfoot's being interdimensional and there's people that turn their nose up at this and this possible connection. I think about these stories that Mr. Paulides has uncovered of these people who seemingly have gone further than they should have gone in a short period of time. Or there's some kind of disparate time that they were in. Oh, yeah. They clearly were alive, but in another location, but then somehow they still wound up dead 10 Mm -hmm. miles from where they vanished from in a territory that they'd been to hundreds of times to hunt at or whatever. So yeah, it makes me wonder about this whole portal idea and these windows opening up and closing and crafts coming in and out of them and whatever happened on Skinwalker Ranch and, and what some of the stories that he are, is turning up are saying. It makes you wonder if maybe, and I implied this before, I think I implied it just last week, mm-hmm. maybe this phenomenon is a, like they say about the vortexes and Sedona or whatever. It's not something that's controlled by technology. It's some natural thing that happens, like a tornado or a hurricane. And maybe these things open up and these hunters or these people in the woods wander into them and pop out somewhere else, very much like going into the upside down on Stranger Things. Right. But then you get back out. But something weird is happening. And so I'm rambling. Uh, it's late <laughs> at night. And, hey, I uh, usually do that. You can't, you can't start doing that, too. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully Sarah will cut that whole thing down to about no. a 10-second sentence. I'm just saying it doesn't work when only one of us does. It doesn't work when I'm just doing it. So you can't both be doing it. But no, you're, you're absolutely right. There's a few things, of course, uh, in, in that ramble that give me some uh, fuel for thought. You just, I think, described where that split is or actually Stan did it when he, when he was talking about it, that's where the, the great divide comes. I think within cryptid and Bigfoot research, serious research, when you have serious people researching it, and we're talking about anthropologists and people who take this seriously and try to gather data that point there that they will not cross. They're going to jump off the train, which is interdimensional. That's the thing. People who don't believe in Bigfoot won't even go that route of like, well, it's just a missing primate that's been out in the woods it's very elusive there're not many of them but they maybe there there's an underground network of them and and they just kind of pop up well that's where Stan started he said that himself that's where he well, started well that's what i'm saying that's of course if you're going to make the leap that that there is some type of bigfoot creature that okay all right maybe i'll do that but it's got to be a real physical thing like a man ape or a woman ape like patty and you're out in the woods and you're just very elusive and they're very, they're just very intelligent. They know how to uh, evade regular humans and they know how to hide their, their dead and injured. They can stay hidden. We just haven't seen them, but they are seen quite a bit. So that's one area. And that's, I believe the wood ape conservancy, that's their angle is that it's a wood ape, you know, but we're, it's not interdimensional. Come on. And, and I think that's, we talked about this in the PGF where the people who took that seriously got upset with people who, who to them got woo woo because it cast a bad light on what they were trying to do, which is like, let's just take the first step in saying that it is a real type of animal, some kind of primate. That's acceptable, right? You can at least agree that, yeah, there are big apes and, and giant apes, different kinds used to exist, uh, that were close to nine feet tall. So Gigantopithecus, blackie, uh, still never found out if it's black eye or blackie, but you're talking about the nearly nine foot tall ape. So Here in this case, though, when you start to talk about things that are even less graspable and acceptable, then that split happens. And I think, as as Stan said, this is something very interesting, is that, you know, at the time uh, in 73, when he was starting to study this, that there were researchers who were getting these reports, but they wouldn't dare tell anybody. They're not going to publish these. That's ridiculous. Right. Because now that puts you in that camp. Like, why would you even publish that? That's, you're insane. Again, going back to the Patterson-Gimlin film, remember when Bob and Roger were out there and they tried to follow it, the path of Patty as it disappeared in the woods? What did they say? They found one last wet half footprint on a boulder, and that's it. 
there was no disturbance of brush beyond that. It's right. like she took that half step, boop, she's gone. Yeah, and the brush was too thick. It was too thick. Yeah. And these guys are, especially Bob, they're experienced trackers. They yeah. know when a large animal has gone through brush because that's how you hunt and follow large game. She hadn't done it. It's like the brush was not disturbed. It was like, took that half step and uh, went somewhere. Well, you know, who else did this earlier? And I think was a character who was much more easily dismissed. And we talked about this before tonight's recording session. And that was a, I guess you can call him a paranormal investigator, Jan Eric Beckyard. Oh, yes. Kind of a colorful character, you could say, had a very colorful career and was not really given his due by a lot in his field and actually caused a lot of tension. And I think he was removed and <laughs> he was actually removed at the eighth annual meeting of the International Society of Cryptozoology in Pullman. <laughs> for causing a ruckus, and uh, I think he, sp he spent the night in jail. <sighs> but that's the thing. He was willing to, as they say here, we're just getting this off the wiki page, too. We'll have a, a link to this. But he was ready to use his fists and threats to support his ideas, but they were considered very way out, and that's what paints that idea as being half-cocked. And I think, as you'll see here as I read this, why he got so much criticism, even from other cryptozoologists. So on the wiki page entry here under criticism, uh, it kind of explains that Beckyard's firm belief that Bigfoot and similar entities were interdimensional shapeshifters who could, quote, manipulate the light spectrum so that people can't see them. And this brought him into conflict, not only with skeptics, but other Bigfoot researchers as well, who argued for proof of physical remains. Of course, you can't do that. Uh, how do you prove it disappeared? Well, the, the tracks end. So to be clear, Stan and Jan Eric Beckyard are in two entirely different worlds when it comes to reputation. So my point is when Stan suggests that, no, we've, we've seen tracks that just stop and they shouldn't have. There's, no, there's nothing else around. It's not like somebody leapt. It's not somebody getting picked up by a hot air balloon mid-step to prank anybody. We're out in the middle of nowhere. Then at that point, when Stan says that, and that's the data he collected with his other uh, esteemed colleagues and peers, then I think people have to take notice. And I think that's what Stan was saying, is that we can't ignore this. These reports are coming in, and, and we can't explain them. And the other thing that Stan mentioned was that there are reports of creatures leaving footprints of different numbered toes, five-toed footprints, four-toed footprints, three-toed footprints over the years. That's not Bigfoot. What is that? <laughs> yeah. Is that a goblin? Who knows? That comes back to the Hopkinsville stories. And in addition, the other thing I wanted to say there too, the difference in perception between Beckyard, is that how you say his name? How we think you say his well, name? Well, I would, yeah, he was of Norwegian descent. Yes. His, actually, his family's from Norway. So I would say Beckyard. Yeah, he was a live wire. He's passed away uh, in 2008, I think it was. You have him on one end of the spectrum, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have Stan, who started out um, open-minded, but also very cautious and skeptical right. and believed a lot of these cases were misidentification, and now he's he's got decades and decades or over half a century of research under his belt, and look what he's come around to. Yeah. And that is what's fascinating, and he's coming around to some similar conclusions that this other gentleman was positing, and they came at it from two completely different angles, but achieved similar ideas, which to me says that there's something more there. Because the other thing I love that Stan said just tonight was, you know, I'm not saying this is alien. I, I don't understand mm -hmm. it. I'm saying we don't understand it. We don't know what right. the, the UFOs represent aliens. This is a complex phenomenon that we don't understand. What he's saying, or, you know, with, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth, yeah. but, I, you know, I think what he was saying was like, these are the things that are happening in these events. There are crafts that fly. There are correlations between Bigfoot sightings and these crafts. There are orbs of light. All these things are interconnected somehow, at least um, spatially and in temporally. And those things are, are happening together. And he's just blatantly saying, I don't know what it means. I don't know what that is. I'm not saying that yeah. Bigfoot flew here from Mars and is uh, checking our planet out and then fleeing in spacecraft <laughs> or whatever. What I'm saying is, what he's saying is, I keep hearing these stories and these are people, they're spread out and they don't know each other and they're all seeing the same kind of stuff. And the other thing that yeah. he said that I thought was really fascinating was he talked about an, uh, at least one report where there were was a group of people and some of them could see the craft and others couldn't and they were all there together. 
Yeah. It wasn't just two people. It wasn't just, it was like, oh, yeah. I'd love to know more circumstances about that particular story. But say, in my mind, what I was envisioning that he was describing is, you know, maybe there's five or six people and four of them clearly see something floating in the sky and the other two don't see anything. What is happening there? What's going yeah. on there? And how can we quantify that? I think, again, in, in drawing a comparison between uh, these now gradations uh, of camps of thinking, where you have just ape animal kind of thing hiding in the woods. And then the next step is, okay, there's a lot of other weirdly connected phenomena that we can't ignore anymore. Oopas. Yeah, all these other things. And then here's another point, which is beyond the pale in the old sense of the word where uh, the Romans won't even go that far out into woo-woo land is where Beckyard went. And I think that's what got him poo-pooed, to, to, for lack of a better term here, because there's a couple other things I, I would want to read, something that you you texted me before we started here. Beckyard explained away the need for physical evidence, such as hair, blood, and bones, to prove the existence of Bigfoot by arguing that the creature is, quote, interdimensional shapeshifter that could warp in and out of physical reality, end quote. And he theorized that they may be, quote, the product of tulpas, or thought forms created by people or other entities. So we've certainly talked about that idea, the egregore. We've talked about everything he talked about. So <laughs> we've talked, maybe well, we should be I'm run saying. out of town on a rail. <laughs> well, he's, he's <laughs> applying it to a subject where other people are like, no, I, I can't go there yet. And I think it's safe to say, the smart thing is, is to say like, well, we don't know. Those are interesting hypotheses if you want to do that. Maybe you don't publish that kind of stuff. As Beckyard said in an editorial, for the journal Current Anthropology, Beckyard argued that the study of the wild man, Sasquatch, was the proper study of either parapsychologists or search for extraterrestrial intelligent scientists, not anthropologists. So he's taken his ideas and gone way beyond that. And there's one last sentence I'll read from him. He claimed, apparently, no, this is according to the wiki page here, and I believe this was... Uh, uh, George Norrie's Paranormal Bigfoot with guest Jan Eric Beckyard. So it sounds like an interview on Coast to Coast with George Norrie. Beckyard said he heard Bigfoot's voice telling him, quote, we're not what you think we are. We're here, but we're not real. Like what you think is real. That's an interesting perspective from the other side, from Bigfoot saying, you know what it is? It's like Sam the Sandown Clown. Are you yeah. a man? Well, no, not like you think a man is. Yeah. Are you a ghost? Well, sort of. You know. Yeah. What are the in-betweens there? What, is, what does that mean? What are they saying to him? Okay, so that's pretty way out there. I think he's probably the, the far end of the spectrum. But if you believe or accept some of this stuff, maybe not, because this is so strange that Stan, after 61 years, can't wrap his head around it. All he can say is, like, this has to be studied. There's something going on here. That I can guarantee you. So Do you know the other thing that's a bummer? <laughs> is, yeah. the, is the story that Stan told about where I think it was a woman that came out or whatever and she saw the Bigfoot and it put its arms up like don't shoot I was, <laughs> I and then they saying, shot it yeah it's I like was stop saying, shooting them <laughs> like do we, we don't know if they're gonna yeah. I mean the arms oh, are he up. was fine he was look he well was yeah fine, then he disappeared in a flash of light either he or his compatriots seemed to reappear on the road yeah because the son-in-law then you know he got out his pistol because uh Something may have attacked a mother-in-law there, so he gets out there. He's surrounded, and again, with the glowing eyes, the green glowing eyes, the red glowing eyes, the orange glowing eyes, and it's not all eye shine, I believe, because... Uh, well, I don't know if it is or it isn't. Why couldn't it just be eye shine? I mean, everyone's shining a light in the direction of the thing that you want to look at, and it's nighttime, that it could yeah. just be eye shine. Well, you answer me this. Uh, is it different colors of the rainbow? <laughs> is it well, Is it always just orange with eye shine? I'm not... It, no, again, no, no, no. But I mean, if, if, if something up. is made up organically different, then it's, right. it stands to reason that the reflected color might be different. True. I'll go with that for this moment here. And, and certainly we'll have some biologists and uh, <laughs> veterinarians and, and uh, ophthalmologists calling in possibly to correct us. But my point is that a lot of these stories, people aren't shining any light at these creatures at all. These things are emitting light, it seems. That's what I get from their reports is that it's not like they all have uh, People aren't all taking flash photos of these things or shining uh, bright lights at them or any lights at them. They're seeing them in silhouette or uh, in some other cases. It just sounds like, especially with the green glowing eyes, that's freaky. Yeah. 
Yes. Or bright red. You don't want bright red either. That's usually a sign of danger when you see the bright red glowing eyes. Something is off. But back to your point, yeah, there's an awkward interaction like there is with all these strange creatures because <laughs> they're not from this world. It's like Stan said. I mean, even though Chuck Zukowski had some stories of the of these rogue Bigfoots, which are pretty scary stories, mm -hmm. uh, they do seem to be not the norm. The norm seems to be that you're not threatened and that you're not necessarily in danger. And the stuff that Stan posited that I thought was really fascinating was when he mentioned that maybe the smell, the sulfur smell, is the smell of the transition, like some interdimensional transition process. Uh, ah. I thought that was really fascinating. You want to hear my theory on that when you're when you're done here? Yeah, yeah. And then also I wanted to talk, you know, briefly about the upas. I said a minute ago, that's an out-of-place animal. It's these black panthers, which there are mm. numerous stories of oh, black yeah. panthers in places that black panthers don't live, which right. is fascinating. I feel like there's more of that that goes on in England than in the U.S., but those stories are out there. You know, I think you told one a few years ago on our show about one being sighted in, in a subway or in the tube or something. Oh, that's old hat. Yes. Yeah, no, there's, yeah. <laughs> they're all over the place. But, you know, from our own Midnight Library offerings. Oh, yes. The Black Madame Shuck. Madame Miranda did a, she did one on the Black Shuck. Now, yeah. that's a crazy story that was witnessed, apparently, by a, a whole church when this thing tore through the door and killed a lot of people. Yeah. You know, and it's not like, okay, that's not, uh, and again, we all these jumping off points. Like, that's not the 900s or the 600s where, like, things are kind of, you, know, you know, hazy. Yeah. It's the 1500s, I believe. Like, yeah. around the time of Henry VIII. But, right, um, right. After Columbus got to America. Yeah, so it wasn't real ancient. It's yeah. like, well, they, they, people were keeping records. There were there were smart people around and scholars and, and people jotted things down. And you have this crazy report. And if you thought it was uh, possibly fake, well, a lot of people apparently got murdered <laughs> yeah. in this rampaging. And, and what was that thing? Was it just a loose, uh, was it misidentified? Well, a panther got out because somebody kept it in their personal zoo back then. It's like, eh, I can't say. And then when Stan and, and you were talking about possible portals opening up just for a brief amount of time, or, okay, the other thing I was going to say is that I think there could be a lot of different things going on here at once. As I said earlier, what's so hard about this is that you're chasing a moving target. There's quite a lot of parallels to Skinwalker Ranch for me. A lot. In uh, Chestnut Ridge here. In that uh, strange things are happening. It doesn't seem to be a centralized um, consciousness, perhaps, because you know, we're not talking about a hundred mile long ridge, uh, you know, that's in Pennsylvania. We're talking about a ranch, which is large, many acres, but it's more contained and the events are more trackable. There's a canyon there. Right. A mysterious canyon with a reputation with uh, indigenous people as well. Yeah. So this thing is, it's elusive. It's always one step ahead of you. And uh, it seems to know what you're doing and there's a trickster element to it, but there's all, you know, all kinds of strange noises as well smells. There's a lot of connections to it. But one thing that Stan said that I, I think is certainly worth repeating here because it, it does sound like Skinwalker Ranch is that the more you know about the phenomenon, you know, the stranger it is, I guess, that phenomenon is so strange, it seems to protect itself. That stood out to me too. It, whatever it is, it's either not allowed to let you fully know what it is, or it doesn't want you to know, but it wants to show you. That's something uh, in the uh, George Knapp, uh, Jeremy Corbell, uh, Joe Rogan interview I, I heard is that it kind of wants to show you, it wants to tease you, but it, it can only show so much. And that's either out of the rules or their own self preservation. It enjoys giving you little bits of itself to show you and startle you. But that's it. That's all you're going to get. And then quickly here, in connection with that, I'm actually looping this back around. Aren't you proud of me? Yeah, yeah, nice work. The, the other thing about, <laughs> about the portal, because again, the, the Skinwalker Ranch and the, and the thing opening up and the smells and all the, uh, all the, the jello pudding, all that kind of stuff, what's happening is something that clicked to me when watching a trailer for a new, I believe it's a new production by Jeremy Kenyon Lockyer Corbell, a new documentary with Bob Lazar. Of course, he did that other one I think you and I both saw, which was uh, pretty mind-blowing and, and uh, just cool to watch. In that little clip there that I saw on YouTube, Bob Lazar briefly sums up how this propulsion works. And I'm going to do that erroneously and badly. But just, <laughs> just for you and our listeners here to get the idea, what Bob Lazar was saying was that, okay, look, Everything that we know about our reality and this planet about propulsion 
is Newton's third law. And I usually do my impression of uh, Tars the uh, the robot. From Interstellar. From uh, Interstellar. Yeah. Newton's third law. The only way humans have figured out how to get off the planet. <laughs> That's just my favorite line for the movie. Anyway, so <laughs> basically, for every action, as we all know, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So that statement means, as I'm reading it here off of physicsclassroom.com, physicsclassroom.com, that statement means that in every interaction, there is a pair of forces acting on the two interacting objects. The size of the forces on the first object equals the size of the force on the second object. So what this means is if you have a jet or an airplane or a rocket ship, how that moves is that you're throwing something out the back. It's either hot exhaust, gases, compressed air, fire, whatever it is. Even, even think about the, uh, the combustion engine. You're having combustion inside the engine. That gets metal to turn and the tires to turn. That's how you're going down the highway. Everything that is propelled is because of Newton's third law. You have to get rid of something. That's not how UFOs fly, or at least the one that Bob Lazar claims to have uh, witnessed and understood uh, somewhat himself. This is field propulsion. I can't remember all the details, and I think it's uh, element 115. When that is manipulated, used as fuel, there's such a tremendous energy conversion that it actually warps space-time and the field of gravity in this bubble. So what's happening is that the way this craft is moving, this element is used. Imagine blowing up a balloon in front of you. That's the warping of space-time and gravity and the craft is propelled forward into that void. So when a UFO flies, maybe there is a general in the area warping of space, time, and gravity that you're, you're ripping a hole into another reality or dimension. And with that comes some nasty smells, weird sights, weird animals, cryptids, ghosts, lights, all kinds of phenomenon pour out of that and then maybe get sucked back into it. That was complete crap, but that's my theory. I'm, yeah, I'm speechless. <laughs> no, I don't know, but no I like thing. it. It's interesting. It's interesting. I mean, it's, what I'm saying is that know. this UFO, the way the one that Bob Lazar was saying he was working on, uh, does not throwing anything out the back. There's no rocket. Uh, there's no, it's not like a jet where it's taking air and, and funneling it down to create thrust. It opens up a warping of space time and then propels itself within that bag, within that big warped bag. So that is to say, when there are UFOs around, maybe all this other weird stuff happens along with it. And maybe sometimes it's just natural. I, like I said, I don't think it's the single uh, reason that all this is happening that's all blamed on UFOs. I'm just saying, if there's a lot of other weird phenomenon going on, it's a weird hot spot. And maybe that lingers, like the whole Chestnut Ridge area. Why was 1973 such a hot spot? Was there a convention going on for UFOs or any aliens or, or Bigfoots and the UFOs showed up? I mean, who knows? It just seems to be in certain spots, a lot of this is concentrated. And as Stan had found out, it goes up and down year to year. Nothing that he's witnessed so far is big as 1973, but it still happens. And the other point I wanted to make was that it's not as much, but the quality of these experiences and these documentations is much higher. One of the things that I remember, and I mentioned this on the show too, and what you just, all you're yeah. repeating what Lazar said about how these craft might travel, which mm -hmm. would then coincide with some of the events that Stan's been describing, was also something I read a while back. And I, as I said, I think it's been a while since I mentioned it, was a book called Above Black by a gentleman named yeah. Dan Sherman. From his own website, it says, uh, Dan Sherman spent nearly three years of his life as a member of the U.S. Air Force working for the NSA as an electronic intelligence specialist. During that time, he was an integral part of a project called Preserve Destiny, a project deeply involved with alien contact. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. It could be an episode on its own, yeah. and maybe eventually we could have Mr. Sherman on. But one of the things I remember from reading it, and this was several years ago, was that he had an impression of some kind of travel or method of propulsion that had to do with phase cancellation, which I yeah. thought was yeah. really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who likes sailing, and also how, you know, a very rudimentary understanding of fluid dynamics and the idea that, you know, when you sail, it's not that the wind is pushing you, it's that the low pressure on the other side of the sail is pulling you, much the way right. the low pressure on the top of the airplane wing is lifting the airplane. It's not that right. the uh, air is pushing the plane up. 
And when you think about phase cancellation and what that is, I always think about sound waves and noise cancellation because that's exactly mm -hmm. what noise cancellation is. It's by meeting this wave with its opposite, you cancel it out. Is, is that like the cartoon thing where you have the uh, 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 Bugs Bunny or the Pink Panther has the fan and he's blowing it into the sail? Yes. <laughs> when he doesn't <laughs> No, need that's wind. not. No, but that's, okay. I do love that. Uh, okay. No, that's <laughs> okay. hilarious. No, okay. but, the, you know, but it is this idea that there's some kind of, propulsion that can be born from that. These are right. just entirely different concepts from internal combustion, as you were saying. And yeah. if there is any way to use that to get around, it would coincide with some of these sightings. And welcome back to tangents, people, because we've, we've gone on one here. <laughs> but yeah, um, some of you were complaining. You haven't been, uh, we've just been having interviews and uh, <laughs> not enough tangents been, and, and not endless amounts of us on and on and on and on. Yeah, we're so bringing we, it back right now. Yeah, but um, okay. I, you know, I'm going to wrap this up. I, I think my yeah. final thoughts on this are that what Stan is doing is valuable work and I think that compiling all the information and all those reports, the reports are going to speak for themselves. And of course, when you look at reports, and I think he does this, you have to think of mm -hmm. uh, not only your own confirmation bias, but also the inaccuracy of witness accounts and all those different possibilities. I think he's taken all that stuff into account. And I think that yeah. the stories that he's sharing with us or the reports that he's sharing with us that he's so passionate about are the ones that he stripped all that away and still can't figure out what happened. Those are the ones that we're hearing about. And right. those are always the ones that are important, the ones that there is no explanation for that. And those kind of stories are left over even from Project Blue Book. There's always that, well, we couldn't figure that out and we still can't figure it out. And that's the whole point of a show like ours is to find those and uh, shine a light on them and say, what is this? What is this thing that we don't understand? Yeah, I absolutely agree. You have to keep searching. You have to keep collecting the data because... I think it'd be ridiculous to still maintain, unless you haven't looked into this stuff and then you don't know about it and it just seems all crazy. But once you have, and I think that's the point with Stan, you start off rational, you start off wanting to just uh, get solid, rational, reasonable answers that you can live with. And the more you get into it, the more you realize like I, there's stuff going on I, we, you can't deny. It reminds me of something Russell Targ says in his band TED Talk, <laughs> in the lab at least, what do you consider proof? And his answer was, proof is evidence that is so strong, it would be statistically unreasonable to deny it. When you really look at the data, you take all these collection, you know, collect these anecdotes and also some trace physical evidence like the footprint casts and, uh, you know, reports from uh, credible people. And yeah, I know that's not something in a jar or in a box. Maybe the government has that stuff. Who knows? But we don't. So we can't make judgments on that. But I think if you're like Stan and you're out in the field, and you talk to people and you go to these sites and you, you have all these anomalous trace effects, at least, you have to consider there's something going on that we don't understand. And like Stan said, I'm not saying that UFOs are giving rides to Bigfoot. That's not what I'm saying. But there does seem to be some kind of correlation of strangeness with all this and that all these things happen, but there's so many different rules. Like you said, with the horrible stench, it happens a lot. I think of all the stories like with Momo and the, and the bad smell or, or the skunk ape. But is it the ape themselves that smells? Well, probably. It, <laughs> I'm not sure what their hygiene is like. They probably have a bit of a funk, I'm going to guess. But maybe also a lot of that is where they're coming from and where they're going back into or the, the nature of their existence for a tiny bit in this realm. Maybe that's also bringing the smell. So there's so many things going on because like what Stan said, it's not every case. Sometimes there's no smell. I think it's unlimited, perhaps, in the, the amount of variations of scenarios, of realities, of answers. And it's going to be really hard, probably impossible, I'll say impossible, to really get a definitive overall answer that satisfies everyone because we're just not meant for that. But here's my point in listening to tonight's episode and, and having these discussions, which just having the discussions to us is fun and enthralling and worthwhile. And uh, are we leaving here with any answers tonight? No. But it made you wonder, hopefully, and entertained you. It got you interested and got you thinking. So when it's all said and done, maybe none of us get any answers, at least not in this lifetime or maybe not in this reality. But maybe getting an answer that's a universal truth that satisfies everyone, maybe that's not the point. It's important, but maybe it's not the point right now. Maybe the point right now 
is to keep asking the questions. That's going to wrap up tonight's show, folks. A very special thanks to Stan Gordon. We'll be back next week with a new show, and believe me, you're not going to want to miss it. It's a fascinating story about an astonishing media legend that is pretty mind-blowing, so come back for that. Please remember to support our sponsors. They help keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi, I'm Josh. S-C-O-T-A-Y-D-O-N for November. These guys are fantastic. T-T. Galaxy-wide in perpetuity. Our show is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also our head of research. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane, and our sound design and additional composing is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to the Astonishing Research Corps. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also support the show at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. Good night.